So it's a great honor to have guests with us today. As I've alluded, we're moving through the book of Nehemiah. I want to invite all of you to open up to the book of Nehemiah. And as you do that, I want to dismiss the children that are with us. Thanks for joining us. Have a wonderful time at Sunday school. And you're going to find an outline also in the bulletin. If you'd be so kind to remove that, there are some critical principles in this text that I believe are worthy of our attention and especially of our response and our application. So I want to start with a question. Uh, some of you may be too young to have experienced this, but has anybody ever been to an event, perhaps a sporting event, where they did the wave? Anybody? Seen or at least seen it on TV? First time I experienced was the Los Angeles Olympics. It was at Dodger Stadium, and the U.S. was playing China to get into the finals for the gold medal. And we were sitting on the third base side. And I heard this rumble and this thunder and shouting and everybody began to look where that was coming from. And it was on the opposite side, over on the first base side. And all of a sudden we saw an entire section standing up and putting their hands and cheering. And then we watched it move around the stadium. And as it got closer to us, I'm like, this is so fun. And we jumped to our feet and raised our hands up. And it was so significant, they literally had to stop the game. It went all the way around the stadium three times, 60,000 people cheering just to be in that place. And I remember just getting chills going, this is so exciting to be a part of this event. For 26 years, Cornerstone Bible Church held its Easter service at Azusa Pacific and Upper Turner Campus Center. Many of you were there and experienced 1,100 worshipers would gather together. And I remember that as the shouts of, he is risen, and they'd respond, he is risen indeed, and songs of redemption would go forward, I, I felt that same chill. It was like so amazing to be a part of the community of God, all of us in agreement, worshiping Christ and declaring his resurrection. I'd oftentimes wonder in the days after that, and I think, is that emotion that I experienced in that worship any different than what I experienced in a sporting event or a concert or someplace else? Think about that. When you have these feelings in these gatherings, these senses, is it something spiritual? Is it supernatural? Is it just something that we experience emotional? You know the answer to the question. The answer is yes, it is different. It is different for us as Christians in a community to know and experience God. But it begs the question, how? How is this distinct and unique? As we've been going through the book of Nehemiah, we've been watching this group of individuals who did not know God. They heard of God, but they were raised in Persia. Their ancestors had sinned against God, and they were taken to captivity first in Babylon and then ultimately in Persia. So 90 years has passed since the first wave of exiles came back. And through that, they began to have to rebuild, have a new idea of what it was to be a community, to, to understand God and to experience God. And so we've witnessed how they've moved through this place of beginning to realize that God was speaking to them and he was calling them to do something for him, to be on mission. And so today we're going to understand there's some characteristics now that they've come to this place where God says, this is what it looks like to be a community. We're going to see characteristics that are absolutely relevant to us. So we're going to study the whole chapter, but I want to begin by reading verses one through four. I want you to notice what they did to be a part of a community. And if you are able to help me to honor the Lord and stand as I read God's word. Nehemiah chapter 11 beginning in verse one. It reads, Now the leaders of the people settled in Jerusalem. The rest of the people cast lots to bring one out of every 10 of them to live in Jerusalem, the holy city, while the remaining nine were to stay in their own towns. The people commended all who volunteered to live in Jerusalem. These are the provincial leaders who settled in Jerusalem. Now some Israelites, priests, Levites, temple servants, and descendants of Solomon's servants lived in the towns of Judah, each on their own, property in the various towns, while the other people, both from Judah and Benjamin, lived in Jerusalem. Thank you. May be seated. Community. Community is one of Cornerstone's six core values. If you're here at the beginning of the year, we did a series on our core values. So more than likely, each of you 
have heard a message or a sermon about community. And many times when that is being introduced, that theme, our minds immediately go to how do we benefit from being in community? What are the things that we receive as being a part of a community? And if that's your mindset, I want to change your presupposition right now. Because what I want you to realize that when it comes to Christian community, it's not about what we get, it's about what we give. And many times, messages that I present to you are ones of affirmation. But today, this message is about exhortation. This is about how you and I are called by God to live in Christian community. And we're going to see three things in a summary and a take-home truth. So I would like you to write down the first thing that we're going to learn. What do we experience when we live in community? In order to experience community, we must make a covenant. We must be a covenant people. We make a covenant to God and we make a covenant to others in community. Now, in order to have context, I want to back up to chapter 10. I want you to see how we get to chapter 11, this talk and conversation about community, what led into it. And back in chapter 10, I want to direct you to verse 39, the last verse in the chapter where we left off last week. It's recorded, the people of Israel, including the Levites, are to bring their contributions of grain, new wine, and olive oil to the storerooms, where the articles for the sanctuary, for the ministering priests, the gatekeepers, and the musicians are also kept. Notice, we will not neglect the house of our God. We understood last week that their ancestors had done that very thing. They did not put God first. And so these individuals, as they've come out of captivity and are now living in Jerusalem, they heard the word of God for the very first time. Being raised in a foreign country, they didn't have the scriptures, they didn't have the temple. And so Ezra, the scribe, got up and read to them from the book of the law. And we understood that more than likely that was from Deuteronomy. And in Deuteronomy, it made this declaration, you are to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And among other things, they began to realize and they began to be gripped with conviction that they had not done that. In their ignorance, they had not lived that way. And this brought them to repentance and they made this commitment, this covenant, we will obey the law. We're gonna do exactly what God has told us to do. So what were the things they were covenanting to and how does that set up community? still in chapter 10. Turn back with me to verse 28. I want to read verse 28 and 29. Just take a moment to revisit what we learned and how it fits today. In this place, they're going to talk about if this is what the law says to do, what God's word says to do, we're going to covenant to do that very thing. Verse 28, the rest of the people, priests, Levites, gatekeepers, musicians, temple servants, and all who separate themselves from the neighboring peoples for the sake of the law of God, note, for the sake of the law, for the sake of what's taught in Deuteronomy, together with their wives and all their sons and daughters who were able to understand, all these now join their fellow Israelites, nobles, and bind themselves with a curse and oath to follow the law of God given through Moses, the servant of God, and to obey carefully all the commands, regulations, and decrees of the Lord our God. So if you're just joining us, what was being understood is what was taught from the very beginning. When the nation of Israel was brought out of Egypt, you're all familiar with that story, how God brought them out of Egypt, parted the Red Sea, and when they were standing right on the threshold of going to the promised land, Moses taught this lesson to them, and he talked about the fact that as you love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind, love your neighbors as yourself. And part of what that meant was they were to be a holy people, a people that were set apart, that were distinct, and it wasn't meant they were to be prejudiced, that they were looked down or to be arrogant. What it meant was their mindset and their attitudes and their behaviors reflected serving a perfect and holy God. And their mission, Cornerstone family, their mission was that when they obeyed God, God would bless them and the other nations would see that this was the one true God. They would forsake their false gods and they would say, we want to worship Yahweh, the one and true God. That was always the plan. And it was neglected. It was overlooked. So this group of people says that plan makes sense. If this God really is faithful and he's true, then he's worthy of following. And if he loves us so much and has been so patient, it would only expect that we would return that same kind of love and live in this kind of covenant. Now, I want to stop for just a moment. And I need your attention because this is a critical part, I think, to understand this text. It is my perception 
that most people in the Christian community do not understand the whole idea of covenants. It's a foreign concept. There's an assumption it's a contract. It's not a contract. Hear me on this. There are many covenants in scripture. One of the most famous is the Abrahamic covenant. When God called Abraham, the covenant he made with him, he says, if you will trust me by faith, I will make you the father of a great nation. And when you go back to the book of Genesis, we are told that Abraham trusted God, put his, or put his faith in God, and God credited him as righteous. And now we have history, thousands of years to look and see how the nation of Israel is a, a nation that has survived all kinds of atrocities. God was faithful to his covenant. Second famous one is Davidic covenant to King David. We're told in scripture that King David was a man after God's own heart. And though he wasn't perfect, he sinned, he failed. God knew that he was sincere and he made a covenant to David. He said, if your descendants will obey me and lead the nation to worship me, I will make sure that there is a king from your descendants always on the throne of Israel. Think about how faithful God is. Even when his descendants did not do that, they did the exact opposite. God showed to be faithful and merciful. And we know through the New Testament that Jesus Christ came from the line of David and now is seated at the right hand of the Father. He is king. God is faithful to keep his promises in his covenant. Now you come to the New Testament, and this is one that probably most of you are familiar with. It's the new covenant. On the night before his crucifixion, Jesus stood before his 12 disciples, and he held up the bread, and he held up the cup, and he declared to them, this is a new covenant that I am making. And then he said, do this in remembrance of me. And as he held out the bread, he said, take it. This is my body given for you. And then he held up the cup. And he said, this is the cup and the new covenant. This is my blood that is shed for you for the payment of sins. And when he did that, he was initiating this new covenant relationship. What was he saying? That if you put your faith in me, you are entering into a covenant relationship with me. And what that expects is that I will keep my promise and I will forgive you of your sins. I will clear all of your debts and I will now give you assurance that your name is written on the book of life. Is that amazing that Jesus Christ would do that? But every covenant relationship has both parties that have responsibility, correct? Abraham's responsibility was to trust God. David's was to obey the Lord. Another one that runs all the way through the Old Testament is that God said, if my people obey me, I will be their God and they will be my people. There is a responsibility of both parties, so if Jesus has made this promise in this new covenant, what's our responsibility? Let me give you an illustration that will help us to understand. These are my motorcycle boots. I purchased them over 20 years ago. They look pretty nice, right? Almost brand new. So when I bought these boots, Alpine Stars, I also bought the full helmet right on the street, the face covering. I bought a leather jacket. I bought the gloves. And I even did this. I even went to the DMV and I took the test that made sure that I knew the laws and I knew the lingo. Now, let me ask you a question. Would you say that I was well outfitted to be a part of the street bike community? Show of hands, a number of you. you. You know what was missing in that? I never bought the motorcycle. <laughs> and that's why the boots look so good. Wouldn't you agree? For someone to actually be a part of the street bike community, one of the most important things is they would actually have a motorcycle. What's the point of my story? I would say that there are many people who claim to be a part of the Christian community. They've gone out and they bought the leather-bound Bible. They have the church app on their phone. They've gone through church membership. They know all the answers and they pass the test and they have the lingo and they know the law. There is just one thing missing. There is a vehicle that's missing. Do you know what it is? Let me show it to you. It's gonna come on the screen. It's called the new command. 
if you know the sequence of what happened in the Last Supper, as Jesus introduces the new covenant, he's washed their feet, and then he introduces the new command. It's all together. Read it out loud with me. Let's say it together. You ready? A new command I give you, love one another as I have loved you. So you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Remember the mission of Israel? That they were to love and obey God, and God would bless them, and others would then see how God loved them and want to be a part of a worshiping community that elevated Yahweh, the one true God. Here's our mission statement. A lot of organizations and churches have what's called mission drift. They forget why they exist. One of my number one jobs, in case you didn't know it, as a lead pastor is to be responsible to make sure this church never wanders from its mission. There is a reason why it's on the wall that you and I are to love God and others well, because it's rooted in this passage. It's a command of what it is to be in community. We are to love one another. And how is that parallel with the nation of Israel? Because when we love one another, the world outside will look and say, there is something distinct about that community, and I long to know the God they worship. We have a responsibility. The main vehicle is to love one another, and that comes and plays out in community. So I want you to write this response down. It's going to come on the screen, and our response is to be devoted to one another. Now, that should take you just a split second to jot that down. And then I want your attention. So I want you to read Romans 12. You're going to go to Galatians 5 by the end of the week. But this week, I want you to read Romans 12. And there's specific verses I want you to camp out on. One is verse 10. So Romans 12 is basically Paul writing in detail of what it looks like to live in a Christian community. But one of the things that he will assert is that we are to be devoted to one another. Now, I want you to write something else down. Two questions. What does devotion look like? Write that down. We can talk all day long on what it is to be devoted, but we have to have a framework of what devotion really looks like. Here's the second question I want you to write down. Who are you devoted to? I'm not talking about your family. I'm trusting you're devoted to your spouse, your children, your grandchildren. I'm talking about Cornerstone Bible Church. Who are you devoted to? And when we start thinking about that, it comes with a certain responsibility of how then do we love one another? There's a lot of different ways. And, and I, would, I would agree that the 9th through service, it's a little bit harder. There are a lot of you at the 9th through service, and it's hard for those that are watching online. But I'm going to challenge you, if you haven't already, to start a prayer list. Begin to pray for people. Certainly, pray for your families, pray for people you work with, pray for people you go to school, but start praying for the people at Cornerstone. And one of the ideal ways is that, because here's, here's the thing that's fascinating. Even those of you who go to the 930 service, you sit in the same place. Do you know that? I know right where you sit. And when you say, how did you know I wasn't here? Because you're not sitting in the seat you always sit in. <laughs> yes, Chris, yes, yeah. So, so that means there are 15 to 20 people that typically sit around you. Do you know the names of the people you sit around? Do you know their history? Do you know their background? Do you know what their lives are about? Do you know the challenges, the struggles? So part of being devoted to one another is actually getting to know those people and love them and take an interest and be concerned about it. So as you have a prayer list, think of a way as you know the names of these people and you let them know on Sunday morning, hey, I was praying for you this last week, or you mentioned that you're going to have a doctor's appointment or you're going through a difficult time. Follow up with them, but, but you don't have to wait till the next Sunday. If you've gotten their phone number, send them a text and let them know, hey, I was praying for you today. Or write them a note or grab a cup of coffee, but make space for devotion. Be devoted to one another because it's the main vehicle of being a part of a Christian community. Here's the second thing. If we're going to be in a community of God, we've got to then give contribution. Excuse me, commitment. I'm ahead of myself. You wish I was too. We're already on point three. Commitment. So you're saying, how is covenant and commitment different? Covenant is what we will do. Commitment is how we will do it. Let me take you back to chapter 11, verses one through three. Watch again 
how they went about making a commitment to be a part of this community. Now, the leaders of the people settled in Jerusalem. The rest of the people cast lots to bring one out of every 10 of them to live in Jerusalem, the holy city, while the remaining nine were to stay in their own towns. The people commended all who volunteered to live in Jerusalem. These are the provincial leaders who settled in Jerusalem. Now some Israelites, priests, Levites, temple servants, and descendants of Solomon's servants lived in the towns of Judah, each on their own property in the various towns, while the other people from both Judah and Benjamin lived in Jerusalem. You look at it and are saying, what exactly does this mean? What are we talking about here? First and foremost, you need to understand the sequence, and some of you may recall it. So when God brings them back, the first thing he tells them is you must rebuild the temple. You've got to establish the sacrificial system so the sins are covered. Second thing you must do is rebuild the wall. So here's this invitation then to be in community, starting with the temple, and then the wall symbolized God's protection. It also helped to have this distinction. They were holy people set apart for a mission. But then as they went forward, they were then to be committed to worship, to consistently have worship. Now we get to chapter 11. They say, okay, now that these things are in place, you're to be in community. And being in community requires sacrifice. So coming back to what the state of it, now, now that they've moved to this location, what's happening within the larger community? Most of the people lived out in the surrounding areas and villages. They were farmers. And the leaders understood if there's going to be this experience, if they're going to carry out their mission, there had to be people living within the city. There had to be a certain populace and demographics that was communicating this message outward. And so the question is, since there were few that were living in Jerusalem, how would they go about doing that? So they came up with this plan, and that is that they would then cast lots. And that was very common among the, the community of God at that time. They cast lots, trusting God's providence to choose individuals. So if you're paying attention in the first verse, it says they cast lots, and one out of 10 families would leave their village, and they would move to Jerusalem. And it sounds very simple to us, but stop and think about it. Put yourself in their shoes. Let's say I came up with this plan and I said to you, everybody that lived in surrounding communities, San Dimas, Covina, Laverne, Upland, and I said to you, our mission is to reach the surrounding area in the community so that people know the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we don't have enough people living near the church. So I want you to sell your house in Upland, sell your house out in Laverne, and I want you to move in and pay these massive prices for rent here in Glendora. I want you to quit your job out there and I want you to find a job here. I want you to move your children from their schools to the schools here and I want you to start a new life. How many are all up for that plan? Even better, we'll cast lots. I'll throw dice and we'll decide which of you are going to do that. Isn't that great? That's essentially what they're asking them to do. They're asking them, as many of them farmers, to uproot their lives and move into the city and find a new career. To take their children that had friends in the community, the village they're living, and leave those friends and start all over to find a new life. So if you're also paying attention, you get to verse two, because they knew this was a significant sacrifice, they commended those who all faithfully obeyed that order. And then if you look at verses three through 19, it's a list of the people that were willing to make that commitment. So the summary of that is that everybody contributed. So they appreciated those who saw that this was a need in order to have community, but everybody was committed to contribute. And if we went back to chapter 10, we would take note of those verses that were 32 down through 39. All of that was saying that everybody in the community was going to give something in order for worship to take place. They're all going to contribute. And if the, those that got to stay in their own town, in their own village, it wasn't like, hey, hope it goes well for you. No, they had a responsibility to come to the city to support those others and help make worship go forward, to carry out their mission. And they did that. So the question is then for us, how do we make that kind of commitment? What does that look like for us to be committed to the community of Cornerstone? So I'll tell you a story that will lead into that. When our children were born, Monica and I made this decision that she would stay home and care for them as infants and that I would do the work. And so I don't know, when they started reaching preschool age three, four, five, I'd come home, and if you have preschoolers or you remember what it was like, is that when they're infants, it's a lot easier, but when they're preschoolers, they're just everywhere. 
And it's like you clean one thing up and it's a mess someplace else. And, and so I came home. I came home one day after work and I looked around and I'm like, I had the audacity to say, why does a house look like this? What do you do all day? Okay, so for my young, my young friends that are husbands, don't ever say that. It never, <laughs> never goes well. But I did. What do you do all day? Well, that led to a discussion. And, and that discussion led to the decision that she would go back to work one day and I would watch the kids on that day. So it's the first day on post. And I heard that they like scrambled eggs, so I made scrambled eggs. And I put them before them at breakfast and they said, we're not eating this. Mom doesn't make eggs this way. Like, What's wrong with the eggs? They're just not right. So I saw what was going on, a little power struggle, and I'm like, I'm not going to lose this battle. <laughs> so I sent them off to the rooms, and I got mayonnaise, and I mixed the mayonnaise and the eggs, and then I spread it on white bread. And when they came back for lunch, I'm like, here's your lunch. I'm like, what is this? <laughs> it's your breakfast that you didn't eat, you're going to eat for lunch. And they boycotted me. I'm like, ooh, they're tougher than I thought. And I thought, I'm going to leave it there because sooner or later they're going to get hungry and they're going to humble themselves. They're going to come back and beg for dad's egg salad sandwiches. So about three hours go by and they disappear. And I'm like, hmm, look in the trash, not there. And I'm like, I won. They got hungry enough. They ate the sandwiches. No. Monica got home about 530 and they brought the evidence out and they brought it to Monica. I'm like, this is what he tried to make us eat. This is like borderline cruelty. And in that place, I got my answer of what Monica does all day long. What's the point of the story? You and I need to walk in the people's shoes around us. We need to walk in the people's shoes around us. So in this community right here, there are single moms who are carrying a huge burden, huge and those of us that are married and we're partnering together, we, we don't take notice of how hard and how difficult that is for them. There are more than one individual whose spouse does not know the Lord and they come by themselves. And they come and they show up faithfully. We need to think about them and consider them and be mindful of their struggle. Do you know in our church, and this is going to increase, there are a number of widows and widowers that come every Sunday. They used to worship with their spouse in this service, and their spouse is no longer here. This is their family. We need to walk in their shoes and be considerate and mindful of them. And I'll give you another one. It, it's shut-ins. Shut-ins is another one. And I'm, I'm going to expand upon that in a little bit. But, but if you're tracking with me, then I come to this idea. So what is, what is our response to this? So on Wednesday, I want you to go back to Romans 12, and I want you to look at verse 16, and I want you to think about what Paul says, that you and I are to live in harmony with one another. So the two questions I want you to write down is, what is harmony? What does it mean to live in harmony? And the second question is, who am I not in harmony with? If you understand the answer to the first question, the subsequent question then expects us to think about, is there someone that we are currently not in harmony with? And what do we do? How do we rectify that? But I, on this particular one, I want to give you a few other things to write down, okay? Everybody still with me? First one thing I want to write down is listen. So coming back to walking in other shoes is that we all have room to improve when it comes to listening, whether it's our spouse, our kids, the widow, whoever it might be. And so I want you to be mindful. The second thing is I want you to write down is empathy. Empathy is an area, if we're going to talk about being devoted to one another, and we're going to talk about what it is to be in harmony with one another, we have to have empathy. We need to understand what people are experiencing, what they're facing, and be able to walk alongside. But the third thing is we need to bear with one another, another one another's in Scripture. What does it mean to bear with one another? That means we need, as we have empathy and understanding, we, we need to walk with them and give grace to them. There are families where their marriages are struggling, and that doesn't get fixed overnight. Some of you have friends. Some of you yourselves may be going through that. It's critical that you bear with one another. Here's another aspect of how this applies. One of the awesome things that's happening at Cornerstone is that God is bringing people that don't know the Lord to Cornerstone. 
and, and I'm meeting every single week. And if that's you, welcome. I'm so glad that you're here. But I just want to say to you, Cornerstone family, that when that happens, yes, people get saved. They meet Jesus Christ. They get baptized. But their lives don't get fixed right away. They come with difficult situations. And if you look down on them with judgment, if we look down upon them and like, why is your life such a mess? How did you make these decisions? We have been guilty of the very thing that sent Israel into captivity. If anybody should be understanding a patient with someone who's in that plight, it should be us because Jesus Christ showed us the same mercy and compassion while we were still sinners. Christ died for us to demonstrate his love for us. All the more that you and I should have that kind of mindset and consideration. But ultimately, as you take a look at that, one of the things that I really want you to think about is gratitude, to be thankful. Be thankful for the people around you, thankful for what God has done in your life, where he's brought you. Because if you do that, you're much more likely to live in harmony with one another. Someone who's discontent and disgruntled is a person that I could show you evidence does not live in harmony with the people around them. So when I, when I make that mention, where do we do that? How do we come out? Here's, here's some commitments practically where some of you need to think about. Some of you received Christ some time ago and you're still not baptized. Jesus himself said, be baptized. You need to increase your commitment by being baptized. And one of the reasons why it's supposed to be done within the church is it's about community. It's not about doing it off by yourself. It's about making this public statement and say, I am a part of this community because Jesus Christ saved me. For some of you, it's joining the church. You've been hanging out here for a long time, but you don't actually know what Cornerstone believes. You've never attended a make it home class. You love what you see happening, but you need to make a deeper commitment. Quick parenthetical. I don't care what relationship it is. If it's a business relationship and you've been in partnership with somebody for a while, you have to make a deeper commitment. Partnerships that fail are ones that don't continue to make deeper commitments to each other. If you're an employee or employer, it's the exact same thing. If you've been at a place you've been working for longer than five years and you've not renewed and increased your commitment, then what's going to happen is it's going to grow stagnant. And it's true for marriages. If the last time you made a commitment to your spouse was at the altar and you've not renewed that and revisited that, do that today. Because every season in your marriage requires you to give a deeper commitment to your spouse and say, I am in it with you to the very end. And that is absolutely true of the church. If you're hanging out here and you haven't deepened your commitment, I guarantee you within a certain period of time, you will grow stagnant, you'll become disgruntled, you'll not like what's happening, and you'll miss out on the blessing of being community. Remember where I started? This isn't about what we receive, it's about what we give. And so God is calling us to that. Here's the third one. I already gave it to you. You probably already wrote it down. And it's contribution. So let me show you what they did to contribute and then we'll, we'll wrap it up. So I want to take you to verse 20. I'm in chapter 11 still, verse 20. So we've already talked about those who made the commitment to actually move to Jerusalem, make this big sacrifice. Now we're going to talk about those who were the nine families of the casting of lots that didn't. So the rest of the Israelites with the priests and Levites were all in towns of Judah, each on their ancestral property. So they, they're living in these locations. Verse 21, the temple servants lived on the hill of Ophel, and Zia and Gispa were in charge of them. So there's one location that's on the hill called Ophel. And so that community had a responsibility to live in, in that region and support the mission. Verse 22, the chief officers of the Levites in Jerusalem was Uzi, son of Bani, and the son of Hashbani, the son of Mataniah, and the son of Micah, Uzi was one of Asaph's descendants who were the musicians responsible for the service of the house of God. So over and over, it's talking about their responsibility, what they're going to contribute. In revisiting chapter 10, it's a more detailed list of what they would bring to the temple, what they would be responsible for to help ensure that worship continued. But now they're revisiting in a summary to say that includes even those that don't live in Jerusalem where the, where the worship is taking place, but those that are on the outskirts. And it's your responsibility to make sure you travel to get to worship and contribute what, you're, what you have said that you would do. And the summary of that, the essence of that is that the assertion I just make is when you pay it forward, it moves it forward. Do you hear me that? 
when you live in a Christian community and you pay it forward, it moves the community forward. If you were to go to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, Paul would argue in a different way. He would say that if you put your faith in Jesus Christ, every single one of you has a spiritual gift. And it's your responsibility to move the community forward by using that gift. He said it's only when every person is serving and ultimately then is bringing their gift forward because it edifies the whole body. And he says if they don't do that, there's, there's an aspect where the body is anemic. And so as we talk then about the deeper commitment, another one is that some of you have not stepped into discipleship groups. That's another commitment that I would press for. You're going to hear more about that in the next two weeks. But the fact of the matter is, is that very little discipleship happens in a service like this. There's a certain amount where we can teach the word and that has a definite benefit, but there's not an engagement. There isn't that place where you get to dialogue and talk back. Although some of you do talk back on Sunday mornings at 9.30, I will acknowledge that. But I don't know how much that's really discipleship. (laughs) And the same thing when it comes to commitment or for contribution and that's serving. So here's the response that I want you to put down. And that is that we're to serve one another. We're to serve one another. But, But I want to alert you to a problem that exists so that you don't fall into this trap. So I had the privilege, some of you know this, last month to travel to Ukiah, California. There's a young man named David Allen. Some of you know that name. He grew up in this church. He moved up there, started as a youth pastor. And on August 13, I've had the privilege of mentoring for the last seven years online. On August 13th, he was installed as the 35th senior pastor of Ukiah First Baptist Church. It was just an amazing blessing to see this young man that grew up in our church now leading this church into the next generation. And so there was a lot of driving, and I took my sunglasses, and when I, the, the particular sunglasses my son had bought for me, so there was a certain sentimental, they were good glasses, but they were sentimental. I got to the airport, went through security, and when I got home, I realized that I lost those sunglasses in security and they weren't gonna be found. So I told Monica about it and I said, I'm just really sad that I lost these glasses that Tyler got me. And she said, you know what, let's let's go get you a new pair. She goes, we didn't celebrate your birthday, let me go get you a new pair. So we went to Victoria Gardens a couple weeks back. And, And if you've ever been out there, I mean, there's stores everywhere. There were five different sunglass stores. I went through every single one of them looked at all these different brands. Ultimately, I landed in the store that actually sold the brand that I once had. And then I spent another 20 or 30 minutes trying on all different styles of sunglasses. And you might be asking, why would you do that to Monica? Why would you drag her all over, (laughs) make her look at all these different sunglasses, most of which looked exactly the same, and say, what do you think, babe? Why would you do that? Because that's what consumers do. That's what consumers do, is that they look at the different options, they look at all the different brands, they determine their cost if they're affordable, and then they pick the one that fits them the best. When I spend time with my pastor friends, my colleagues each month, you know what the most common problem they perceive exists in the American church? Consumerism. Consumerism. People who claim to be a part of the community of God do the same thing. They'll go to five or six different churches, kind of see if it fits them, if it's the right style, determine its affordability. How much is it going to cost me to be here? What do I have to put into this community? And I want to say to you here at Cornerstone, if this is your first Sunday, welcome, welcome. If it's your second Sunday, then you're part of the community. (laughs) And, And I say that sincerely. Is that why does that exist? Because people that are doing that are going from church to church saying, what is it, what am I going to get out of this? And that's not the message. That's not the biblical message. The message is if the church teaches the word and they're faithful to the word, then get involved, be committed. If you're visiting here this Sunday and you're going back home someplace else and you don't have a church to worship in, find a church that teaches the Bible, go there and be committed and contribute because when you give you receive. When you pay it forward, you move it forward. That's the economy of God. That's how it works. So I want to come back to some practical ways of how do we do that. So if we're to serve one another, the question I want to ask you is, what are we serving? What is it that we're serving? What are we doing? And what difference does it make? Especially, I want you to ask the question, who do you serve? Who is it that you serve at Cornerstone Bible Church? So as as I make that mention, let, let me 
let me just visit a few things that are available and needed. There's a long list, but I want to go back to shut-ins. So shut-ins at Cornerstone is an increasing populace. There are many people that, and, and this is going to, this is going to continue to grow because as people are living longer, their health is not being maintained and they are in difficult situations. And though they'd like to be here in person and community, they can't. There are some, in fact, every single week, Sherry makes CDs and we mail these CDs to a group of individuals. And that's because they don't either have or know how to use technology to watch online. Imagine, they don't get to hear the worship. They don't actually get to see and experience what happens here at 930. What would it look like if you knew how to help with technology that you went to those individuals' homes or residents and actually helped them go online and watch and experience a worship service? And let's say they are unable to do that for whatever reason. What would it look like if you actually took those CDs to that person's house once a week and spent 20 or 30 minutes with them and prayed over them? Don't you think that that as an aspect of contribution would change their predicament and their perspective of knowing that every single week someone was going to come and take interest in them and pray over them? 9.30 service continues to be crowded. I, I, there was a group of individuals that normally at 9.30 and they came at 8 o'clock just to try to help make spaces. Awesome. If you're able to do that, I would love for you to either go to the 11 or 8 o'clock service. But here at the, at the 9.30 service, this is your service. There are ways to contribute. We want to we have more hosts in the service so that we can help everybody feel welcomed, not be overlooked and lost. In addition, need for ushers and helping Brian and Stephen and helping others get seated. I can go down the list. Our local missions, you could serve in a local mission every single week. Shepherd's Pantry or Foothill Pregnancy Resource Center. There are so many ways for you to get involved. So if you're not serving, mark your connection card. Let us know. We're building an infrastructure in order to help people actually experience community and what it looks like. And that brings us to the take-home truth. Here it is. We experience community when we live in community. We experience community when we choose to live in community. Have you noticed the trend in buildings and developers, what they're doing? There's a, there's a development in Upland off the 210 freeway just past Baseline Exit when you're going out to the east. It's about two years old. The houses are massive, 2,500 to 3,000 square foot, two stories, but they're all right together. There's no backyard, a little tiny porch so they can barbecue, no front yard, no porch whatsoever. And if you've ever just out of curiosity gone into those homes, a model home, consistently what they have in the second story is they have this massive entertainment room. They have one wall that has all the electronics so they can put a 76-inch flat screen on it. And they're selling like crazy. You know why that is? It's because families don't live in community. That they they sit in a room and they all watch the television and technology. They, they, don't, they don't live out community and they don't live out community with their neighbors. They don't need a front yard and a porch because they don't talk to their neighbors. You know what I say to you? I say to you that when we get to heaven and Jesus said he went away to prepare a place for us, it's going to be a little tiny cottage with a massive front porch and a huge front lawn that says, get out and be in community. Would you please bow your heads, close your eyes. Father, I, I want to start by acknowledging that there may be some who have not joined the community. They, they've not put their faith in you, Lord Jesus. And they, they like what they see and they hear, but they don't have a relationship. They're, they're not in that new covenant that we talked about. And so I'm asking that even right now or in the closing songs where the prayer team, as they would come and say, I want to, I want to know the Lord Jesus. I want to have that relationship with him. And I want to live in his community. But I pray for all of us. The fact of the matter is that including Pastor Bruce, we all have room for growth. There's at least one thing from this text that all of us can improve and grow on. So in light of the theme of exhortation, I pray that we would humbly stop this week and ask you, what do you want us to do differently? How do you want us to participate how do we fulfill the mission that you've given us? It's in your son's name I ask, amen.